shine in our hearts, O Master, who loves mankind, the pure light of your divine knowledge. And open the eyes of our mind that we may comprehend the proclamations of your holy gospels. Instill in us reverence for your blessed commandments, so that having trampled down all desires, we may lead a spiritual life, both thinking and doing all those things that are pleasing to you. For you, Christ our God, are the illumination of our souls and bodies, and to you we offer up glory together with your Father who is without beginning, and your all holy, good, and life-creating spirit, now and ever into the ages of ages. Amen. Please be seated. Good morning, everyone. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodius, host of the 2017 National Oratorical Festival, dear families of the 2017 finalists, and importantly, you, the finalists themselves. St. Paul says to the Corinthians, you are a letter from Christ, written with the spirit of the living God, not on tablets of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. In just a few moments, you're going to share with us what God has written on your heart. Finding and refining those words was not an automatic task, I'm sure. There was no magical inspiration, but came about through the persistence, okay, probably pushing, of your parents, guidance from teachers and priests, study and thought on your part, and then practice, 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 and no doubt, prayer for help from God to get it done and get it right. That you're presenting your speech at this level of the festival is testimony that all these factors were at work. Congratulations to you. I'm especially glad that this year you have the opportunity to deliver your talks at Hellenic College Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology, the highest educational institution of our archdiocese where scholarship and thought in Orthodox theology and the liberal arts advances our church and our culture. Believe it or not, some of your ideas may actually inspire new ideas for our community. Also, by being on campus, we've been able to assemble one of the most impressive panels of judges we've seen in the festival. I'm glad they're judging you and not me. Also, Holding the events of the festival on this campus is a unique opportunity. And my thanks to the Hellenic College Holy Cross community for their support for today. And who knows, maybe some of you will enroll here one day. Again, many thanks to His Eminence Metropolitan Methodius, Mr. Fodi Papyrus, and the staff of the Metropolis of Boston, and the Annunciation Church of Woburn, and especially Father Dimitri Mott, for their work to ensure that this entire weekend became a great experience for you and your families. They've worked very hard to show off the best of this metropolis and region, and I hope you will remember it for many years to come. Finally, I have to say something personal. As some of you know, I've been out of commission for the last couple of weeks dealing with some personal matters. The staff of the Department of Religious Education stepped in to bring us to, a day, this, to us this day in a way that I knew they were capable of, but to see them in action has been most gratifying. Let me especially single out Angeliki Constantine for her leadership to make today possible. Well done, Angeliki. And as I like to conclude my greeting to this festival every year, this is not my, my ability to give a speech, but yours. So let's get started. Thank you. And I want to call on Dr. Jim Skedros to represent Father Chris and offer a brief greeting from the school. Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to Helena College Holy Cross Greek Orthodox School of Theology. Uh, on behalf of our president, Father Christopher Metropolis, who is traveling overseas, um, I just bring the warm welcome um, from him and our entire faculty and staff and students. Uh, as Father Tony said, this is kind of a unique place for you to be, to be able to deliver your theological um, speech 
within a context in which there's been a lot of speeches in this chapel over the years. And as uh, Father Tony said, uh, I'm sure you will actually give us things here um, on faculty here, some of us who are here today, things to think about as we ponder our Orthodox Christian faith. We're happy you're with us. We're happy that your family is with us. We're happy that you're here if it's only for a day. If you come back as a student, whether as an undergrad or a grad student, all the better. Um, but we just wish you all the best and congratulate you for being here. Thank you. Your Eminence Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, Deacons, our esteemed panel of judges, our 2017 finalists, parents, and guests. It is an honor for me to welcome you to our 34th National Oratorical Festival. This year's weekend is unique because most years the events are hosted by a single parish in a host metropolis. Whereas yesterday, we were welcomed by the Annunciation Parish in Woburn, and they will host our farewell luncheon following the hierarchical liturgy tomorrow. This morning, we have gathered on the campus of Hellenic College, Holy Cross, where we will soon hear our 18 finalists deliver their homilies. Later on this afternoon, the Holy Metropolis of Boston will provide us with a tour of the world-famous Fine Arts Museum, a tour of Boston, Faneuil Hall, and finally a delicious dinner which will bring an exciting day to a close. It takes many months of planning to assure that you have an unforgettable oratorical festival weekend. I want to thank the Metropolis of Boston, especially Metropolitan Methodios, and everyone on the host committee for their warm welcome and hospitality. Even after all these years coordinating the oratorical festival, I always excitedly look forward to receiving the names of the Metropolis finalists. While I recognize some and am eager that I will see familiar faces, I am most enthusiastic for our first time participants because coming to nationals is a wonderful experience and I'm thrilled to have as many children as possible experience that in their lives. Before we begin, we hear the speeches, I would like to introduce our panel of judges. Those judges, the junior division, are the Reverend Father Constantine Newman, Dr. Menius Caranos, and Dr. Elizabeth Podromos. The senior division judges are Dr. James Skedros, Dr. Kiriaki Fitzgerald, and Dr. George Stavros. Their bios are listed in the program, therefore there is no need for me to read them. There will be a short break in between divisions, at which time I will introduce the participants by name and the metropolises and parishes they're from. We will also be given an opportunity to take pictures, so we ask that you do not take any while someone is speaking. Introducing our speakers to the podium will be past National Oratorical Festival participants. Our orators will be introduced by the speaker order number they selected at the orientation session earlier this morning. I kindly remind you to turn off your cell phones, and if you do have to get up, please do so in between the speeches. So without further delay, it's finally time to begin listening to our orators. Thank you. Your Eminence Metropolitan Methodius, Reverend Fathers, and finalists, good morning. My name is Basil Vergatis, and I was a Metropolitan of Boston finalist in 2013 and 2014. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number one, whose topic is number five. Explain why the Orthodox Church focuses more on the resurrection than it does on the passion and suffering of Christ. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Your Eminence Metropolitan Methodius, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants and guests, good morning. The church is dark. Everyone waits in pure silence while the darkness envelops them. And then in the midst of that wall of darkness, a single flame flickers. Come receive the light, chants the priest, and slowly each candle eats away at the darkness that has been consuming the entire congregation. Easter is the most important feast day of the Orthodox Church. We spend 40 days celebrating Christ's resurrection, and we remember it every Sunday in the Orthros and the Divine Liturgy. 
But why do we focus so much on the resurrection and not as much on the passion and suffering of Christ? Why do we end Good Friday Lamentations on a happier note with flower petals and rose water instead of remaining solemn and sorrowful? Though we do acknowledge the pain Christ went through out of his immense love for us, by focusing on the resurrection, the church celebrates the triumph of life over death and provides us with a model on how to live our daily lives. Through the resurrection, death was defeated and life was restored to the world as evident during the Apostle Sermon of St. John Chrysostom, which states, O oh death, where is your sting? O oh hell, where is your victory? Christ is risen and you are overthrown. Christ is risen and the demons are fallen. Christ is risen and the angels rejoice. Christ is risen and life reigns. When Christ descended into Hades, he loosened the bonds of death, showing how his grace cannot be contained by the evil one. But he did not only resurrect himself, in the icon of the resurrection, Christ is depicted pulling Adam and Eve from their tombs, showing how he redeemed the sins of everyone, even the original sin, and in doing so gave all of us a chance at attaining salvation. It is this salvation that we continue to strive for 21 centuries later. In our modern lives, it is still the resurrection of Christ that infuses our daily routines with meaning. As St. Ambrose of Milan explains, Basca means the crossing over, for it was on this day that the Son of God crossed over from this world to his Father. What gain is it to celebrate unless we imitate him whom we worship? That is, unless we cross over from the darkness of evil doing to the light of virtue, from the love of this world to the love of your heavenly home. St. Ambrose is telling us that we have to cross over from this secular life into a more spiritual one. Though we all have activities that we love to do, for me, singing, acting, and speech, we have to remember that everything in this life is temporary. If we fail to acknowledge this, our souls are blocked from the light of Christ and remain in darkness. I'm not saying we should drop everything we love. All I'm saying is that we cannot let these worldly activities inhibit our spiritual growth. This year, I was involved in the musical in my high school, and one of the mandatory rehearsals I had to miss because it fell on Holy Saturday morning. But no matter how much I love musicals, I have to understand that the light of the stage lasts only while the curtain is open, while the light of Christ lasts forever. Now, in our lives, we'll have more pressing issues than a musical rehearsal on Holy Saturday. But once we show God our preference for him over our worldly cares, our souls will then be able to resurrect themselves from this life into everlasting life. And this is why the resurrection of Christ is so important to the Orthodox Church. Through the resurrection, death is overthrown and redemption is granted to all who choose to fill their souls with the joy of Christ's teachings. So while the darkness of the church is replaced with the light of candles at the Anastasi service, we remember that Christ too replaced the darkness of Hades with everlasting light showing how each and every one of us can do the same with the darkness that covers the inside of our souls. And in doing so, we will celebrate not only the resurrection of Christ, but the resurrection of ourselves from this temporary life into the eternal gates of paradise. Thank you. Your Eminence Metro Metropolitan Methodius, Reverend Fathers, finalists and guests, good morning. My name is Kairos Regatos, and I was a Met Metropolis of Boston finalist in 2016. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number two, whose topic is topic number three. Discuss the role of bread and its symbolism in the Bible and the life of the church. Speaker number two. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, and my brothers and sisters in Christ. Why do you come to church? What exactly is going through your head when you wake up on Sunday morning that makes you get out of bed, drive your car down the highway, and sit here for two hours? If you're being honest with yourself, you're thinking, for the bread. And if you aren't, well, the Lord says, thou shall not lie. But don't worry. I'm here to tell you that you don't need to feel guilty. That bread, which becomes the body of Christ, 
is one of the best reasons you could possibly have for your piety. During Divine Liturgy, we recite the Lord's Prayer. We ask God to give us this day our daily bread. The premise of this phrase can be traced back to the Old Testament. When the Israelites escaped from Egypt, they ran out of food and began to despair. Soon thereafter, God told Moses that he would rain bread from heaven, Exodus 16, verse 4. This manna sustained the Israelites for 40 long years in the wilderness. Through daily prayer for bread, we are humbly relying on God to sustain us day after day, just as he did long ago. Not only does bread serve as a reminder of our trust in God, it also acts as a symbol for the Son of God. Jesus is symbolized in the Bible by a lot of things, vine, teacher, shepherd, but one of the most important comparisons is to bread. In chapter six of the book of John, Jesus says he is the bread of life, the bread that came down from heaven, and that he who comes to me shall never hunger. So what role then does bread play in the church? Holy Communion is one of the church's most important sacraments. In Matthew 26, verse 26, Jesus says, take, eat. This is my body. Partaking in the Eucharist means to receive Christ into your life. And receiving Christ means receiving forgiveness, love, and eternal salvation. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. John 6, verse 53. Just as bread has always been the base of the food pyramid, so too is Jesus the foundation of our lives. Through the sacrament, we remember his sacrifice for us on the cross. He is literally within us after having received Holy Communion. We can now see more kindly with Christ's eyes, feel more compassionately with Christ's hands, and love more deeply with Christ's heart. He is now at the helm, compelling us to ask ourselves, what would Jesus do before acting? I know why I come to church. I eagerly anticipate receiving Holy Communion every Sunday, as I'm certain that if we don't believe in the bread of life, we're toast. I think it's easier for a camel to fit through the eye of a needle than it is for a gluten-free man to enter the kingdom of heaven. That's just a joke. So I encourage you, the next time you wake up for church and the first word to pop into your head is endideron, the next time you find yourself on the edge of your pew as liturgy heads into communion, the next time you take two pieces of bread from the bowl, don't feel guilty. Go ahead, eat your heart out. Thank you. It is my pleasure to announce speaker number three, topic number two. St. John Chrysostom said, our arms, are not our, arms, our arms are judged not by the measure of our gifts, but by the largeness of our mind. 52nd homily on the Gospel of Matthew. Discuss how even small acts of kindness and generosity can make a difference. Your Eminence Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants, and guests, good morning. Almsgiving is defined in the Book of Tobit as giving of oneself above and beyond of what is expected. Almsgiving is an important component in the practice of our Greek Orthodox faith. In Homily 52, St. John Chrysostom tells us that the intention with which we offer our help is more significant than the amount of help we offer. 
Our acts of charity should be merciful and kind, not grandiose and attention-seeking. This year at my school, we have a kindness count challenge. Each morning, we are reminded to act kindly throughout the day. Even the smallest acts of kindness, when your heart is compassionate and humble, can make a big impact on someone's life. Last Christmas, my brother and I experienced a random act of kindness at Starbucks. The barista told us that our drinks had already been paid for. I was surprised and thankful. It made me feel special. This small random act made my day happier. In the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 6, verses 1 through 4, it is discussed how we should give alms and that our actions should be quiet and anonymous. When you do a charitable deed, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, that your charitable deed may be in secret. Matthew chapter 6, verses 3 through 4. That was how we experienced our Starbucks act of kindness. We do not know who treated our drinks. The parable of the Good Samaritan, Luke chapter 10, verses 25 through 37, teaches us that kindness should be extended to everyone mercifully. The Samaritan was the third person to pass the injured man on the road, but the first person to stop and help him. The priest and the Levite saw the injured man and crossed to the other side of the road to avoid him. The Samaritan tended to the man's wounds and took him to an inn to recover. He told the innkeeper he would pay for everything. Christ concludes the parable by saying, go and do likewise. In high school, the hallways can be congested and chaotic. I was on my way to class when, across the hallway, a boy who I didn't know dropped his binder. I crossed and helped him collect his papers. He smiled and thanked me. He felt valued that someone cared enough to help, and I felt the grace of doing the right thing. Acts of kindness represent the Holy Spirit that is within us. Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. As Christians, kindness should be spontaneous, and kind acts of mercy are required by our faith. In Proverbs chapter 15, verse 30, we are told sins are cleansed by almsgiving and faithfulness. Kindness helps us develop a forgiving heart and brings us forg forgiveness from others. Christ shows kindness and generosity at his own crucifixion. When he calls out to God, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they do. Luke chapter 23, verse 34. When we act in kindness, we show others we care. And when someone feels cared for, they feel valued and less alone. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number four on topic number four. The Orthodox Church venerates saints and martyrs every day. Talk about a saint who inspires you to become a better Orthodox Christian. Speaker number four. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodius, Reverend Fathers, Honored Judges, my brothers and sisters in Christ, good morning. As the Christians gathered to worship deep in the catacombs, the priest requested volunteers to take the Eucharist to the jailed Christians to give them courage. Whoever went would surely be arrested if they were caught, and the holy gifts would fall into the hands of unbelievers. Send me, said a young boy named Tarsisios. He convinced them that no one would suspect him because of his age. So he held the Eucharist close to his heart and traveled to the prisons. Along the way, he encountered some boys his own age who asked him what he carried. Unwilling to surrender the Eucharist, the boys began to beat him mercilessly. A soldier and secret Christian saw this and chased the boys off, but by then, Tarsisio succumbed to his injuries. Miraculously, the Eucharist was found intact, meaning he fought with each breath, 
to protect the body of Christ. This boy, no more than 14, clung to Christ and gained the crown of martyrdom. But how can this boy martyr who lived almost two millennia ago be an inspiration to my life? After all, the times of persecution are over. But what if I told you that the last 120 years have been the bloodiest time for Christianity? During the 20th century, over 30 million Christians were martyred, over 20 million in Russia alone under communism. Today in North Korea, over 70,000 Christians are confined in concentration camps, and up to three generations of a family can be arrested just for owning a Bible. The daily plight of the Christians in the Middle East is something that is horrifying beyond belief. Christians being slaughtered and brutalized on a daily basis, aware that at any time, they could be forced to endure unspeakable atrocities, like the twin bombings on Palm Sunday that killed 50 during the liturgy. These persecutions may seem like they don't affect our lives, since they are so far away. But in 2015, during a mass shooting in Oregon, the gunman asked his victims if they were Christian. If they responded yes, then he shot them in the head. Think of the courage of those who confess their belief, knowing their fate. How did St. Tarsisius and other Christian martyrs endure and remain courageous? The simple answer is spiritual bravery. St. Paisius of the Holy Mountain says, in the spiritual life, even the most cowardly person can acquire great bravery if only he places his trust in Christ. Such a person can go to the front line and fight in a war and win. How do we gain this unstoppable spiritual bravery? Spiritual boot camp, like a soldier preparing for battle through increased fasting, receiving the Eucharist more frequently, confessing to our spiritual fathers, and above all, prayer. As St. Paisios explains, a soul at prayer can hold the enemy at bay. Do we have opportunities to practice spiritual bravery in our daily lives? Indeed, something as simple as doing our cross amidst non-religious friends can go a long way. Spiritual bravery can also mean standing up for someone being bullied and standing up for the unborn child. Nowadays, society is telling us that our beliefs are not politically correct. Spiritual bravery means not compromising our faith in the name of political correctness. So, my brothers and sisters in Christ, let us call to mind and pray for those being persecuted every day and remember the martyrs of our time so that we may learn from them and live by their example. Let us pray daily for the grace of God to prepare ourselves for spiritual training so that we may become spiritually brave through his grace. Let us cling to Christ with every ounce of our being, like young Tarsisios, so we can become, as St. Paul says, greater than conquerors. Let us all step forward and without hesitation say, send me, amen. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number five, speaking on topic number four. The Orthodox Church venerates saints and martyrs every day. Talk about a saint who inspires you to become a better Orthodox Christian. Your Eminent, Metropolitan Methodius, Reverend Fathers, fellow parishioners and guests, good morning. We as Christians venerate saints and martyrs and ask for their intercessions, assistance, and guidance. One saint that inspires me to be a better Christian is Saint Veronica. Not much is known about Saint Veronica. However, church tradition teaches us that she received a most wondrous gift from our Lord because of her compassion. Saint Veronica was in the crowd that mocked and taunted Jesus as he carried his cross to Golgotha. Rather than laughing like the rest, she pushed past the jeering crowd, ran up to Jesus, and knelt down beside him. With humility and kindness, she gently wiped his face with her headscarf. She was soon taken away by the Roman soldiers. Upon returning home, St. Veronica realized that she had been given a wondrous gift. Imprinted on her headscarf was the face of our Lord Jesus Christ. I needed to know more about this strong and courageous woman who risked her life to show compassion. 
while researching her memoir, I found that church tradition teaches us that she was, that St. Veronica was the woman we read about in the Bible who suffered from an issue of blood and was healed by Jesus. Perhaps that is why she was so moved by Jesus' suffering, because she understood what it is like to be in pain. In Matthew 9.20 we read, a woman who had suffered from severe bleeding for 12 years came up behind Jesus and touched the edge of his cloak. She said to herself, if only I touch his cloak, I will get well. Jesus turned around and saw her and said, courage, my daughter, your faith has made you well. At that very moment, the woman became well. This event was important because not only was it recounted in Matthew, but also in Mark and Luke. In most interpretations of this Bible reading, the main focus is the healing power of Jesus and that the faith of the woman made her well. Although these are important lessons, I believe that a significant directive is being overlooked. Jesus clearly instructs St. Veronica to have courage. This is an obvious foreshadowing. Jesus knows that she will need to be courageous in order to show him kindness and compassion despite possible persecution. I look around me and see many people who, like St. Veronica, show compassion and love to me every day. My mom, of course, loves me every day and helps me become a better person. And although there are many occurrences where she has shown me kindness, there is one way that stands out the most. After many years of praying for a child, my parents decided to adopt. Before the adoption paperwork reached China, my mom found out that she was pregnant with triplets. Many people pressured her to cancel the adoption. Little money had been spent and no specific child identified. It would be easy. After much prayer, my father and mother felt that they had a spiritual connection to the unnamed child they had requested. To proceed with the adoption, my mother had to hide her pregnancy from the Chinese government and went as far as hiring a blind social worker to finalize the paperwork. Four months after giving birth to my triplet brothers, she boarded a plane to China alone to get me. This is just part of the story, however. Several years after my adoption, my mother found papers that her mother had saved from her childhood. One essay from her third grade English class made her stop and marvel at the hand of God in her life and mine. The concluding sentence of this essay was, when I grow up, I want to adopt a child. That child, so many years later, was me. There are many forms of bravery and courage. St. Veronica showed courage in the face of death, and my mother showed courage in the face of family pressure. I see many similarities between St. Veronica and my mother. Both women showed courage, kindness, and compassion. And I hope someday I could follow in their footsteps and show courage in the face of adversity. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number six on topic number one. The opening petition of the Divine Liturgy is, in peace let us pray to the Lord. What is this peace, and why do we need it to begin our prayers? Speaker number six. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants and guests, good morning. Our Divine Liturgy opens with the petition, in peace let us pray to the Lord. But are we really able to do this? We live in a world where we do not seek peace, contentment, and connection to God, but excitement, entertainment, and stimulation. Kids are constantly looking to the bright flashing lights of video games for a sense of pleasure. People are always rushing off to movies or parties or their many obligations without ever having a quiet moment. The BBC reports that children aged five to 16 spend an average of six and a half hours a day in front of a screen. Although this way of life may seem fun for a while, it ultimately brings anxiety, not peace. C.S. Lewis tells us in his book, Mere Christianity, 
What Satan put into the heads of our remote ancestors was the idea that they could invent some sort of happiness for themselves apart from God. God cannot give us a happiness and peace apart from himself because it is not there. To truly seek happiness and peace, we must not pursue constant entertainment, but instead, as we sing in the cherubic hymn in liturgy, we must set aside the cares of this life that we may receive the king of all, and through doing this, we will find true peace. In our loud world, the only way to find the peace needed to pray is by actively cultivating silence. We cannot hear him over the din of the thoughts swirling around in our heads. In First Kings, the Lord showed himself to the prophet Elijah. The Lord passed by, and a great and strong wind tore into the mountains, but the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. We need to have peace to hear the voice of God revealing himself in his own quiet but powerful way. You may be worrying about an upcoming job interview or afraid of failing a test in school. Maybe you've just turned on the news and are now feeling the stress of the political turmoil and uncertainty of our country. Whatever they may be, the worries and pressures of our daily lives leave little room for any thought of prayer. So how can we overcome our earthly concerns? Being in liturgy is certainly one way. Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 8, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. At the Metropolis camp, we practiced putting the kingdom of God first by implementing what we called alone time with God. Every day we would find a quiet spot and sit in silence for a few minutes to pray. This silence helped me to shut out the outside world and to connect more deeply with God. It is necessary for all of us to schedule alone time with God into our daily routine to hear his still, small voice. For as the prophet Isaiah writes, those who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. So this prayer time is not just one more thing to get done. It is your source of strength to face all of life's anxieties. And then, we will be able to follow the opening petition of the Divine Liturgy. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number seven on topic number three. Discuss the role of bread and its symbolism in the Bible and the life of the church. Your Eminence Metropolitan Methodius, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, Fellow Speakers, Ladies and Gentlemen, good morning. Salt, water, grain. The formula is so simple, yet gives sustenance and life to all of mankind. It is easy to forget that the basic components of bread are gifts that God has blessed us with. Fertile land for salt, temper weather for grain, and rain for water. Bread is embedded into the Orthodox Christian liturgical year and has a significant role in our faith and traditions. We are invited to relive the sacred events of our salvation and we find that bread is always present. Art those for feast days like Christomsomo, Vasilopita, Tsureki, Fanoropita, and of course, Prospero our humble gift to the Holy of Holies. Additionally, the Bible was laden with references to bread. Jesus was born in Bethlehem, which literally translates to the house of bread. And in the Gospel of John 6.35, Jesus directly refers to himself as the bread of life and adds, he who eats of this bread shall live forever. 
seemingly, God wants us to understand our relationship with him within the context of bread itself. He wants us to be like the carefully sowed seeds of grain. He calls for us to avoid the temptations of this world, weeds, and to carefully tend to our spiritual life. We are told to make ourselves humble like the ground grain and to put our neighbor in front of our own needs, sacrificing our being for the nourishment of others. By humbly confessing our sins when we fall flat, we return to Jesus, our leaven, in order to rise. Bread then serves as a symbol for our struggle for salvation. Renowned Orthodox baker Peter Reinhardt calls bread a transformational food as it undergoes a radical change to ultimately become a perfect loaf. As Orthodox, we are called to perfection, to be Christ-like, bread-like. Theosis, or Christian perfection, can only be achieved through the help of God, who transforms and transcends us. Saint Gregory of Nyssa used the word apectasis, which means stretching out, as a reminder that we must strive to exceed our own capacity while on earth. Just as the yeast transforms the dough, an active relationship with Christ is the leaven that will enable us to change. Bread helps us reflect a deeper reality. It represents our duality as Christians. We are of the earth, but we can still rise. Just as yeast is the only active ingredient, Jesus is our only catalyst towards our salvation. The dough requires kneading in adversity and must be scorched by flames in order to bake. We too face adversity and the temptation of sin while on earth, but the Holy Spirit planted a power within us that expands and makes us capable of apectasis. From sin to Christ, from despair to hope, from death to life. In light of this, Saint Isaac the Syrian said, blessed is he that has eaten of the perfect bread of love, which is Jesus. While still in this world, he breathes the air of the resurrection in which the righteous will delight when they rise from the dead. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number eight on topic number two. St. John Chrysostom said, our alms are judged not by the measure of our gifts, by the largeness of our mind. Homily 52 on the Gospel of Matthew. Discuss how even small acts of kindness and generosity can make a difference. Speaker number eight. Your Eminence, Metropolitan, Methodius, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants and guests, good morning. Have you ever been at lunch and noticed the kids sitting alone? What about walking to class and judge someone not dressed like you? How about seeing a homeless man and thinking he is lazy or a druggie, or even a prisoner? Could any of us show kindness in that situation? We judge and are indifferent but don't like to be treated that way. Isn't it basic to do unto others as you want them to do to you? Can't everyone benefit from a small act of kindness? We may be amazed at not only what we can do for others, but what we receive in return. St. John Chrysostom in homily 52 discusses Matthew 15, 21 through 28, in which the Canaanite woman asks Jesus to heal her daughter. Jesus and his disciples tell the woman to go away, and Jesus tells her that he came only to minister to the Jewish. However, because of her great faith, the woman persists, and Jesus eventually heals her daughter. Through this act, Jesus taught his disciples that faith and humility prevail, and to be kind to all, not just those like themselves. As Orthodox Christians, we are taught to mirror Christ, to overlook every prejudice or fear of ridicule. My grandfather, who volunteers with the Orthodox Christian Prison Ministry, the OCPM, 
told me an unforgettable story of a 1995 prison visit. A prisoner who showed interest was given an Orthodox study Bible. In 2015, the same prisoner sent my grandfather a letter telling him that 10 years ago, after completing his prison sentence, he converted to Orthodoxy and now works part-time with the OCPM. He ended by writing, you see, George, you had a big impact in my life with that one visit. Thank you for your time. We never know when a seemingly small act of kindness will have eternal consequences for another soul. This reminds us of Jesus' words in Matthew 25, 31 through 46, where he says, For I was sick and in prison, and you came to me, emphasizing the importance of kindness and caring in our salvation. With all these teachings in mind, this should be no problem, right? I know what to do, so why don't I? Is it because I'm constantly surrounded by my so-called cool friends and don't want to ruin my own image? However, my conscience bothered me. Last year, during confession at Camp Emmanuel, I asked, how do I do what I know is right when I fear ridicule? The priest spoke to me of Proverbs 13.20, which says, whoever walks with the wise becomes wise, but the companion of fools will suffer harm. This insightful priest asked me to try befriending lonely kids I see at camp and assured me that I will not be made fun of. It was a success. When I came home, I looked for an opportunity to do more vowing not to worry about what others thought. Just this year, there's a new quiet kid on my bus and I sat by him. I found out he had moved after his mom left his drug dealing father. Turns out he is a nice kid and now a close friend of mine. Of course, I cannot accomplish this alone. As young people who are still dependent on our families, we need a leader, one who will show us how we can make a difference. Our ultimate leader is Christ. Our earthly leaders can be our church, and our priests. Sunday School and Goya also give us opportunities to practice kindness. We must be aware of not only a person's physical needs, but also their emotional and spiritual needs, such as those of the prisoner or my friend. Which of us can't take five minutes or make a $5 donation to IOCC? From small acts of kindness at local schools to helping internationally, any help is worthwhile. So instead of acting like we are trying to land the role of the most interesting man in the world, let's focus on Christ the most interesting one in eternity. Stay thirsty for Christ, my friends. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number nine on topic number one. The opening petition of the Divine Liturgy is, in peace let us pray to the Lord. What is this peace, and why do we need it to begin our prayers? Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodius, Reverend Fathers, fellow speakers and guests, good morning. morning. A fellow soldier of St. Paisios once described a battle scene. One day, we were on top of a ridge they called Killer Ridge. The rebels sat us surrounded, and there was no exit or way out. Arsenios was standing as bullets flew past us right and left. I grabbed his coat and tried to pull him down, but he stayed just as he was looking up to the sky with his hands held in prayer. Apparently, the Almighty took pity on us because our air support arrived and cleared the road. As we were leaving, I said to him, so what was that all about? Why didn't you take cover? I was praying, he replied. In peace, St. Paisios was praying to the Lord. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. This is the opening petition of the Divine Liturgy. We hear the word peace over 30 times during the liturgy. What is this peace? This peace is not the absence of external conflict. It is inner peace, peace of the soul. Christ says in John 14, 27, peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you, not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. Peace is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. It follows from love and joy. Blessed Theophilac says, one who has peace of soul is untroubled by thoughts or by any external circumstances. St. John of Kronstadt says, the peace of heart through lively faith in Christ proves more clearly than the day that God is constantly present near me and that he dwells in me. 
The divine liturgy is our encounter with Christ, who is the true peace for man. Why do we need peace? We need inner peace in order to fully participate in the sacraments. Peace has been described as oxygen, the clean air in which the church can live. We should be peaceful within ourselves and then amongst our brethren. The prayers before Holy Communion instruct us to first reconcile ourselves with them that grieve us. For example, when I've argued with my brother, I must apologize before I receive communion. How can we partake of the body and blood of Christ if we are holding a grudge? If we are not at peace, how do we expect the God of peace to dwell inside of us? As St. Nectarios teaches, one who is deprived of peace is deprived of divine grace. You might be asking, how do we acquire peace? The answer is through prayer and repentance. When we approach Christ in a state of repentance, he in turn takes us where his peace reigns. By God's grace, we can experience his heavenly kingdom here on earth during the divine liturgy. In order to pray with peace, we need to pray for peace. We begin our day with a prayer, teach me to treat all that comes to me throughout the day with peace of soul. Recently, I had a very important race for my rowing team. Before the race, I was very nervous and stressed. There was loud music playing all around me, people were talking and getting ready, everything was extremely distracting. I realized I needed to take a moment to pray. I said a quick prayer and made the sign of the cross. I was suddenly at peace. It was amazing. Amidst the confusion of the world, just a small prayer in the sign of the cross brings peace. How could Saint Paisios calmly pray as bullets flew by him? He had acquired peace through his life of unceasing prayer. I encourage you to follow his example and in the words of St. Paul, be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving let your requests be made known to God, and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. May peace be with you. Thank you. While the judges are finishing, their speaker evaluation form for speaker number nine. And before I introduce everyone, please let's all give them a wonderful round of applause. <laughs> I am so very proud of our, our nine speakers here, but also the ones that's participated at your district level, your metropolis level, and your parish level. So we, you're representing all of them too, so thank you. And thanks to parents for encouraging your children to participate in this wonderful program. So judges, uh, if you can go to the deliberating room, I'd like to introduce our speakers. Um, and when I do, please come up and stand here and then we'll take some pictures. Speaker number one from the metropolis of Chicago is Irini Stavropoulos. <laughs> Speaker number two from the metropolis of Atlanta is Elizabeth Stamatianakis. Speaker number three from the metropolis of New Jersey is Joanna Nakas. And then you can stand on. Speaker number four from the metropolis of Pittsburgh is Evangelos Kiriakos Crisantos. Speaker number five from the direct Archdiocesan district is Mary Catherine Avaliotis. Speaker number six from the metropolis of Boston is Nathaniel Nichols. <laughs> Speaker number seven is from the metropolis of Detroit, Peter Tetzalis. <laughs> Speaker number eight from the metropolis of Denver is Theodore, Theodore Gallus.
And finally, speaker number nine from Metropolis of San Francisco is Stephen Kalin. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number one on topic number one. The gap between the rich and poor in the United States and worldwide is arguably wider than it has ever been. How should we as Orthodox Christians address such terrible financial inequality? Speaker number one. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants and guests, good morning. It is with great pride that I identify as a Greek American. Greek Americans are among the most highly successful and most educated ethnic groups in the United States. This deeply moves me because I know that the path to this success was not an easy one. Immigrants like my grandparents and my father brought their faith as well as their hard work ethic to the shores of their new home. It was by way of this hard work, newly found opportunity, and self-determination that the ranks of doctors, lawyers, business owners and educators experienced a surge of Greek names. It is in those heartwarming success stories that my pride is planted. That is, after all, the fulfillment of the American dream. Generations later, and that same dream of providing for one's family lives on. However, in 2017, the pressing issue of financial inequality has created an environment that hinders the fruition of this dream. I have found that my generation is all too quick to judge a person based on the phone they have, the car they drive, the size of their house, or the neighborhood they live in. We are aware that Jesus instructed us to love thy neighbor, but commonly, we associate our neighbors with those who live around us, our financial equivalents. The church teaches us, however, that by neighbor, Jesus meant something much more than this. It is easy for us to treat our economic parallel with respect, as in them we see a reflection of ourselves. In Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, however, St. Paul writes, carry each other's burdens, and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. When we put ourselves in the shoes of both our society's most affluent members and our community's most disadvantaged citizens, we adhere to the law of Christ. And through this compassion, we avoid another way in which financial inequality may disrupt our relationship with one another, as well as our relationship with God. We must find viable solutions to this crisis that affects so many Americans today. In my own city of New York, more than 20% of the population falls below the poverty line. Numbers this large are disheartening, as I feel charities and church fundraisers that I am so familiar with have too big a task at hand. Now, I believe that charity is important to a life of faith, but I also feel that charity alone is not enough. My namesake, St. Basil the Great, in the building of his Basiliad, sought out to be charitable. But more importantly, he intended to improve the lives of the poor by teaching them valuable skills. Rather than doling out fish to the hungry, he understood the importance of teaching them how to fish. St. Basil's actions have taught me that 
In an effort to halt financial inequality, we must do more than simply be charitable to those living in poverty. Proverbs chapter 10, verse 4 states, Lazy hands make for poverty. Diligent hands bring wealth. Give people living in poverty the chance to be diligent. And I strongly feel that those who have dreamt the American dream will work tirelessly. I believe in one God, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, the rich and the poor, the fortunate and the needy. It is with the wisdom of God and the innate persistence that he has given us that we as one nation under him will overcome financial inequality. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number two on topic number five. Jesus said, render therefore to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's. Matthew chapter 22, verse 21. When no political party represents genuine Christian teaching, how does an Orthodox Christian navigate political conversations and make political judgments? Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants, and guests, good morning. In the book of Matthew, a group of Pharisees went and plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words. They asked him, is it lawful to pay taxes to Caesar or not? He skillfully rebutted by asking, why put me to the test, you hypocrites? Show me the coin for the tax. When they did, he asked, whose likeness and inscription is this? They said, Caesar's. He then said unto them, Therefore render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's, and to God the things that are God's. The Pharisees were amazed and awestruck. There is a profound message that we can derive from this dialogue in regards to faith and political concern. Give your life to God. In the beginning of this encounter, the Pharisees plotted how to entangle Jesus in his words. They do so by asking a question about taxes. And the reason why this, they ask this question is because there is no Jewish law that states that Jews have to pay taxes to a Roman or to an occupier. But there is no Roman law, or there is a Roman law saying that you must pay your taxes. So the Pharisees are asking Jesus if it is better to follow God's law or the law of the state. If Jesus answers in favor of Roman law, he will be considered a traitor to the Jewish law. But if he answers in favor to the Roman law, or if he answers in favor to the Jewish law, he will not be considered a good Roman citizen. So, Jesus being perfect cannot answer with either of the two imperfect decisions. So, he asks the Pharisees, whose likeness and inscription is on this coin? And they answer with the image of Caesar, and he says, therefore render to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. In other words, give to Caesar the image of Caesar. Give to God the image of God. What is that image of God? That image is us. When voting for a political candidate, the Bible gives no specific evidence on who to vote for. In the New Testament, God never said, I like Trump, you should vote for Trump. And he never said Hillary is a great person. He just told us to devote our lives to him. When a politician uses God's name, he portrays himself as a man of God and is therefore more influential towards the 70% of the American population that are Christians. Using such power for political benefit is using the Lord's name in vain. The dialogue also establishes a clear separation between church and state. Whenever Jesus says, render to Caesar the things that are Caesar's and to God the things that are God's, 
There's simply no room for interpretation. Give to the state what is owed to the state and give to God what is owed to the God. That leads us to the question of how we can navigate political decisions using our faith. The answer is that scriptures and orthodox traditions will lead our faith and make better political decisions. The Bible tells us to feed and clothe the poor, to visit those sick, to visit those in prison, to live in the image of God and to be kind to your neighbor. Use those outlines to guide your political decisions while knowing that there will never be a political candidate or political stance that will be an epitome of our faith. There will always be a middle ground. That is what politics are for. The Bible does not give a specific reason or specific evidence on what is right and what is wrong. They just tell us what is right and what is wrong. In conclusion, we should lead lives devoted to God and we should uh, match our political stances according to what the Bible tells us to do. There will never be a perfect candidate or a perfect stance that we can match to our political stance. Uh, while we give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar, we should more importantly give to God what belongs to God. Amen. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number three on topic number two. Although many people diet for health or vanity, the discipline of fasting is found in many religious traditions. What is the difference between dieting and fasting, and why is it important? Speaker number three. Your Eminence Metropolitan Methodius, Reverend Fathers, Deacons, my fellow Orthodox Christians, good morning. And he said to the people, hear and understand. It is not what goes into the mouth that defiles a man, but what comes out of the mouth that defiles him. Matthew chapter 15, verse 10. In this gospel, Jesus explains to us what is truly important about fasting, that our focus should be on the intention behind the fast and not simply on our denial of food. So what is the difference between dieting and fasting? Webster's Dictionary defines a diet as a regimen of eating and drinking sparingly as to reduce one's weight. While a diet strengthens our earthly body by abstaining from things that are detrimental, fasting improves our spiritual body by abstaining from things that are bad for it or sin. So why does the church prescribe fasting from certain foods? Is the church an advocate for healthy eating, or is the goal to lower our cholesterol? While I'm sure the church is happy that its parishioners are eating well, a fast is more like an athlete in training. Fasting brings us closer to God in two ways. First, fasting teaches us to deny ourselves of worldly desires. We should be in control of our bodies, not our bodies in control of us. Denying ourselves food teaches us how to stay in control. And once we achieve that, we can move on to the more important fast, the fast from the indulgences of sin. Sin is our voluntary separation from God. Sometimes our mind wants us to sin, so we have to train ourselves to fight against these humanly urges. It's not easy to give up foods we like to eat. It takes self-control and determination, but we can do it. Likewise, fasting from sin is not easy, but the reward is great. We may not be perfect in our fasts, but God sees our intentions and forgives us if we stumble. So let's not forget the true meaning of the fast. St. Basil the Great himself admonished those who didn't quite get the idea when he wrote, you do not eat meat, yet you devour your brother. If we can fast from food, we should also be able to fast from things like greed, jealousy, hatred, and other forms of heavenly denial. We can triumph over evil. In his book, The Lenten Triodion, Metropolitan Callistos writes, fasting is not a mere matter of diet. It is moral as well as physical. It is useless to fast from food and yet to indulge in cruel criticism or slander. 
Metropolitan Galistos makes the point that if not accompanied by prayer and compassion, fasting is useless and even harmful as it leads to pride and irritability. The second way that fasting can bring us closer to God is that this small sacrifice of food is meant to remind us of the greater sacrifice Christ made for us on the cross. But through his crucifixion and then glorious resurrection, he made it possible for us to return to the paradise that we as humans chose to leave. Fasting is a constant reminder of that great sacrifice. A few years ago during Lent, I was out for dinner with some friends as they opted for a meat lover's pizza. And at first, I was really excited until came the reminder that it was Lent. At first, I was disappointed until I remembered how Christ was betrayed, arrested, tried, beaten, tortured, and publicly executed, all for our sake. And all of a sudden, choosing a side salad didn't seem so bad. But what if the stakes were higher? Say the same friends get a hold of answers to an upcoming test and offer to share them with you. What do you do? Cheating is certainly easier than studying for the test, but by fasting, you've already won that battle and proven to yourself you can overcome simple temptation. So while diets may improve our physical bodies to make our lives in this world easier, fasting improves our spiritual bodies, preparing us for the next world to come. So as a musician practices, the athlete trains, the student studies, and the singer rehearses, the Orthodox Christian fasts, all to prepare ourselves for the day of judgment where our dedication will truly be tested. Thank you. It is my pleasure to announce speaker number four on topic number three. Psalms are an integral part of matins, vespers, and many other church services. Talk about a psalm that impacts or influences your life. Your Eminence Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants and guests. Good morning. morning. One of my favorite colors is blue. It may be because of what this color symbolizes, calmness, serenity, but it's most likely because I have always enjoyed looking at the deep blue of the ocean or at the eternal expanse of the sky. To me, blue has always represented this immense tranquility one that does not falter and cannot be halted. I really do love the color blue. While I was looking through the Psalms, I read through Psalm 7 and was struck by an image of this color blue. And while at first glance, lines like, Arise, O Lord, in your anger, may not seem to invoke my definition of the color blue, further explorations about the history behind the Psalm did. Psalm 7, entitled A Psalm of David, comes from the story about David's betrayal by his son. In the story, David's child betrays him, taking his possessions and casting him out of his own home. Instead of being irate with his son, David convinces one of his friends to offer his services to the young man as an advisor. This friend, in turn, acts as an informant for David. God is with them, and David's plan works. This story demonstrates that God stays with the just, even in their most difficult hour, something that is challenging to remember when one is experiencing such an hour. While this is a good lesson, it is not the reason I saw blue. Rather, that has to do more with David's interpretation of his situation. His son has betrayed him. Most, under these circumstances, would feel anger and have thoughts of revenge towards those who had wronged them. However, David says, if there is wrongdoing in my hands, if I dealt back evil, those dealing evil to me, then may I fall empty because of my enemies. Then may the enemy pursue and overtake my soul. He returns the hatred his son and his son's allies have for him with calmness asking God to help him to stay innocent of the thoughts of revenge and anger that would plague the consciousness of many others in his position. 
This is the blue, the unfaltering tranquility that I found within the song. Oftentimes, when I am upset about actions someone has taken against me, by accident or otherwise, I am filled with the anger that David chooses to dispel, and I want to take control by dealing out what I believe to be that person's just punishment. This psalm teaches otherwise, clearly making it evident that when we suffer at the hands of others, we should not seek revenge, but should place faith entirely in God's power with steadfastness and loyalty, knowing that he will help us through this difficult time. David also asks God to bring an end to the wickedness of sinners and keep straight the righteous. An interesting point about this part of the psalm is that David is not asking God to destroy his enemies and bring retribution upon them, as is heard so often in the Old Testament. David asks the Lord to bring an end to the wickedness of sinners, rather than to do away with the sinners themselves. St. John Chrysostom comments on this part of the psalm saying, in the case of the soul, we should lament and grieve not for those being punished, they are being led to health after all, but for those sinning with impunity. David is asking God to reveal to the sinners and those who plague David the righteous and good path so that they may return to God and find a place with him. Continuing on this train of thought, I find it important to note that St. John Chrysostom says that being punished for sins is akin to being led to hell. So while I may not be fit to deal out punishment, this statement reinforces the teaching that we can be forgiven if we sin. This offers another image of blue and is a stabilizing face within the psalm. When I feel angry or unhappy, I am able to call upon the words of David, asking God to keep me in his grace under the shadow of his wing. And it's difficult. But in my life, I hope to do my best in channeling the calm I discovered in David's psalm and to find strength within myself to follow the righteous path that David talks about in hopes of entering the kingdom of heaven, a place why I imagine there is a vast expanse, a beautiful ocean, and tranquil sky, the color blue. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number five on topic four. The Lord commanded us not to create idols, Exodus chapter 20, verse four, yet people continue to do so. Discuss the kinds of idols people worship today and the response that an Orthodox Christian should have when confronted by them. Speaker number five. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, Brothers and Sisters in Christ, good morning. A drought is upon their waters, and they shall be dried up, for it is the land of graven images, and they are mad upon their idols. Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 38. We too are in a spiritual drought, and we are mad upon our own idols. God's second commandment says, you shall not make for yourself an idol or a likeness of anything in heaven above or in the earth beneath or in the waters under the earth. Exodus chapter 20, verse 4. Or more simply stated, you shall not make for yourself any graven images. You shall not bow down yourself to them. As Orthodox Christians, we follow this instruction, or we believe that we do. We do not carve literal figures which pagans and other misguided people worshipped. The idols we face today come in a more dangerous form because they are more difficult to detect. An idol can be anything, a person, an idea, an activity, a possession, but they are all equally capable of drawing us off the path of righteousness. An idol is anything which we value and prioritize over our Lord, anything which turns us away from the one true God. How do we create such idols? Having a lack of spirituality creates a void within us, and by allowing ourselves to prioritize and focus on worldly things, we carelessly disconnect ourselves further from God. 
Though we may not be fully aware of this weakened connection with our Lord, we feel its effects as we instinctively search for something to fill the spiritual void. During this search, we latch onto anything we can find in an attempt to fulfill this longing. On the surface, many of these things which we value and prioritize over our Lord begin as harmless, even beneficial. For example, playing a sport is great, but playing on Sunday mornings instead of going to liturgy becomes idolatrous, as it becomes a higher priority than worshiping our Lord. Working out at the gym to be healthy is good, but if you are motivated by vanity and how good you look, then you are allowing yourself to become self-centered. If we become consumed by these otherwise harmless things, we inadvertently create our own figurative idols. And though these idols may not be carved or made of gold such as those made by the pagans, these figurative idols we create are just as dangerous to our spiritual lives. What were once harmless activities, these now negative influences we originally looked to for enjoyment have become a part of us. They now occupy space in our soul, space which is intended for God. But spiritual thirst cannot be quenched in this way. A man searching for water in the desert can be fooled by a mirage, a false image. But the mirage cannot even begin to quench his thirst. It is simply not possible. In this same way, if we are not vigilant, especially in times of spiritual drought, we too can be drawn away by a mirage, a graven image, as we search for the living water, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. As a teenager today, my world is filled with distractions and temptations that could easily draw me away from God. We as a society are in a spiritual drought, and trying to live as a good Orthodox Christian can be very difficult. Only by being vigilant and consciously striving to become closer to our Lord can we navigate through the spiritual minefield and ensure that we do not get drawn away by the dangerous idols of our world. Many kids my age utilize Instagram and similar social media in order to receive instant gratification in the form of likes, followers, and retweets. Instead of worrying about how many followers we have, we must be a follower of Christ, clinging to our faith and looking to eternity and our eternal salvation. Although we were created in the image and likeness of God, many of the things we focus on in life are about the worldly image we portray to others. Rather than focusing on ourselves and worrying about gaining our own followers, we should worry about being a follower of Christ. And rather than concerning ourselves with how we appear in the eyes of those around us, we should worry about how we are seen through the eyes of God. We are living in a society that rewards self-centered behaviors. Our lives revolve around Snapchat, YouTube, Facebook, and other social media outlets which encourage us to glorify ourselves when we should be glorifying God. We are turning ourselves into idols. But we must remember the words at the end of the Lord's Prayer. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Not for mine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. A drought is upon her waters, and they shall be dried up. For it is the land of graven images, and they are mad upon their idols. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number six on topic number three. Psalms are, are an integral part of maintenance, vespers, and many other church services. Talk about a psalm that impacts or influences your life. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants and guests, good morning. Have you ever wondered, how do I approach God? At times, we feel lost for words. We know exactly what we want to say, yet have no idea how to articulate it. This problem has plagued me often in my spiritual life. Today's ongoing bombardment of media cripples my ability to focus on what I need to say to the Lord. Combine this with the intense lure of sin and you have a generation of youth, including myself, in a fragile and spiritually ailing place. However, Psalm 23 is a healing prayer 
that puts my relationship with God in new perspective by providing the words that have met my soul's needs at every turn. The author of this psalm, the prophet David himself, grew up and worked as a shepherd. He knew for sheep to be properly cared for. The shepherd must take them to the fertile areas to graze, protect them from predators, and keep them together so they don't go astray. David loved the metaphor of seeing the Lord as his shepherd. Like the sheep, we too need someone to guide us, keep us on the right path, and guard us from evil. Psalm 23 offered me comfort recently with the passing of my grandmother, Vespina. A golden heart had stopped beating, and once again, I was struggling for the right words to entreat God. Although I have spent nearly my whole life in the holy altar celebrating the hope of the resurrection, it's so hard to think about that when you realize you won't have even one more interaction with someone you love. We read Psalm 23 that evening in our family prayers, and I heard, even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Praying these words is what I needed to feel that powerful reminder that even in death, God is there, and that my Yaya would be safe. Grief can hold us captive, causing us to miss the fullness of God's love and mercy even after this life. When I think of the rod and staff mentioned in the psalm, I think of my parents and my spiritual father who have to poke and prod me the way they want me to go, and that they are my earthly shepherds. At times, I have to fight the temptation that I would be so much better off without all these rules. But when I fall off the path, Psalm 23 keeps me grounded and helps me remember the goal, to go back into the bosom of Christ and not away from it. The collection of psalms can be found in the book called the Psalter. It is divided into 20 sittings, or in Greek, kathismata. The psalms are an integral part of all liturgical services of the Orthodox Church, where virtually all states of a man's soul are expressed, thanking, petitioning, repenting, and praising. St. Basil refers to it as a pharmacy open to all souls, where each of us is able to find the medicine suited to our own particular illness. The Psalms have the power to move your heart and point you to the ultimate liberation of sin, death, and despair. St. John Chrysostom likened reading a Psalm to being lulled to sleep, where one can separate from the wrath in his soul instantly. I have experienced this firsthand when I'm angry after a family argument or a tennis match that did not go well. With Psalm 23, a sense of calm comes over me. One can equate the Psalms to a ladder that helps man make the spiritual ascension, gradually preparing him to meet God. Perhaps the most compelling thing about Psalm 23 is that it is a promise, a promise from God to all of us, that submitting to his will means goodness and mercy will radiate throughout our life, and we will dwell with God forever. This has to be, on any given day, the best news I could hear, that in all my sinfulness, I actually stand a chance, and that each time I am lost, God will come and find me. The Psalms are the golden thread in the beautiful garment of Orthodox worship. They give us the words to entreat God in every situation. Psalm 23 helps me focus on how I need to change when my own thoughts and actions hold me captive. I urge you, pick up the book of Psalms where Christ has sketched the likeness of his perfect life in words so that we can heal and correct our ways. St. Theophon the Recluse says, committing a psalm to memory allows you to be fully armed in prayer. Look at the Psalter and select a psalm that speaks to you. Learn it like I have with Psalm 23, and I assure you, with the grace of the Holy Spirit, you will have found the words to set you free and take you back home again. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number seven on topic number one. The gap between the rich and poor in the United States and worldwide is arguably wider than it has ever been. 
How should we as Orthodox Christians address such terrible financial inequality? Speaker number seven. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, fellow participants and guests, good morning. morning. Nearly half the population worldwide lives on a salary of $2.50 a day. In our own country, 50 million out of 320 million people live in distressed and impoverished communities. That means one in six Americans is suffering in 2017. The margin between the well-off and the poor has never been wider, and it continues to grow. The IOCC, the largest international Orthodox charity, aids people in more than 50 countries with over $580 million spent thus far. In his book, in the world, yet not of the world, Patriarch Bartholomew calls for inter-Orthodox cooperation and inter-Christian dialogue to address the issues of our time, including poverty. Additionally, the Greek Orthodox Archdiocese of America supports the UN's Millennial Development Goals, which aid the poor by targeting donations towards education and health care. Though the church has taken a global role in tackling poverty. Each of us has individuals. Though the church is seeking to alleviate poverty at an international systemic level, there is ample evidence in the Bible that instructs the individual, both rich and poor, on how to alleviate poverty. Christ does not view material poverty as a weakness. In both Gospels of Mark, verse 12, lines 41 through 44, and Luke, verse 21, lines 1 through 4, we are told to imitate the poor widow who gave two mites, while others more wealthy gave much more. The widow gave all she had, while the wealthy kept plenty for themselves. Christ loves and cares for the impoverished, and he does not see them as lesser human beings. However, he does instruct all his children that laziness in soul and in body leads to poverty. Further in this Proverbs passage, we are instructed to be like the ant and the honeybee. We know the ant works all summer to have provisions in the winter, and the honeybee, small and weak, works tirelessly to create honey. Individuals are called on to take personal responsibility and behave like the ant and the honeybee to combat laziness. A person who willingly works has God's blessing and is prosperous. The Bible advises the wealthy individual as well. In Deuteronomy verse 23, line 20, the brotherhood of man is emphasized and the rich are advised not to charge interest on money or food or anything you lend out. This calls for compassionate charity unto those less fortunate. In Matthew verse 26, lines 37 through 46, Christ states that if you feed the hungry, give drink to the thirsty, clothe the naked, and visit the sick and imprisoned, it is as if you have taken those actions towards me. Furthermore, the apostles desired only that we should remember the poor. Galatians verse 2, line 10. Our religion teaches us to care for the poor. Our charitable actions should be propelled by love, not pity. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, but have not love, it profits me nothing. 1 Corinthians verse 13, line 3. If you do something without a loving intention, it is almost meaningless. Caring for our fellow man enriches our hearts, giving us treasure in heaven. Thus, 
we become more strongly attached to God and our Christianity flourishes. Matthew verse 6, lines 19 through 21. As Orthodox Christians, we have a personal responsibility to address the issue of poverty in our own community and worldwide. Our Bible offers inspiration to act. The poor are reminded that they are loved and blessed and that Christ validates hard work. The rich are reminded of the brotherhood of man and that Christ is amongst us in many forms. Our charity should stem from compassion and love. Though our church has taken a global role in tackling poverty, each of us as individuals must honor and exemplify a strong work ethic while sharing abundantly with those in need. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce speaker number eight on topic number three. Psalms are an integral part of matins, vespers, and many other church services. Talk about a psalm that impacts or influences your life. Your Eminence, Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, participants and guests, good morning. morning. O oh Lord, why do those who afflict me multiply? Many are those who rise up against me. King David wrote these words at a time when he was fleeing from his own son, who was trying to kill him. At this time of anguish, David wrote Psalm 3 as an expression of both his fears and his faith in God's help. No wonder it is included in so many Orthodox services. We heard it every night during Holy Week. As I internalized the words of this deep and meaningful psalm, I began to see its relevance in my own life, and especially my social life. I was struggling with feelings of rejection. I felt as though in all aspects of my life, there were people who I thought of as friends who might throw me over for another friend or simply ignore me. I felt as though I couldn't count on anyone to be there for me. I couldn't trust anyone. I was searching for someone in the world to confide in who would always care, always listen, but it seemed like there was no one there. I'm sure we've all felt that way at different points in our lives. Perhaps as a kid getting bullied in school with no one to stand up for them as a teenager experiencing the same feelings of rejection as I have, or as an adult in this fast-paced, ever-changing world, struggling to hold on to a friend as they move away, get a different job, or even die. Verse 3 continues, Many are those who say to my soul, there is no salvation for him and his God. And we may even be led to believe that there is no salvation for us in God to believe that we cannot trust even God to always be there. At this low point, we are encouraged in verses four and five, but you, O Lord, are my protector, my glory and the one who lifts up my head. I cried to the Lord with my voice and he heard me from his holy hill. These particular verses have meant so much to me in my search for a true friend, these verses reminded me that the Lord listens. He will always be there. He will never abandon us. He loves us with a more perfect love than we can possibly imagine. And he knows our pain. As the prophet Isaiah tells us of Jesus, he was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Judas, one of his best friends, betrayed him to be killed. So he knows how I feel. And thus, he can comfort me in my afflictions. And he gently reminds me that I have failed others too. He reminds me, through his example on the cross, to forgive them, for they know not what they do. I feel unbelievably grateful to have such a friend. Now every night when I get into bed, I tell him anything and everything that's on my mind, anything that's troubling me, anything that makes me happy, anything that excites me or scares me or angers me. Then I thank him for anything good that has happened to me that may have been manifested to me throughout the day. 
or ask his help with anything troubling me. I thus found myself following the guidance of St. Theophon the Recluse when he tells us to always strive to pray in this way so that prayer comes from the heart and is not just thought by the mind and chattered by the tongue. And the Lord does help. I always feel more peaceful and tranquil after I get whatever's troubling me off my mind and entrust it to him. As the psalm continues, I lay down and slept. I awoke, for the Lord will help me. In fact, King David has gone from being devastated by all who afflict him to proclaiming, I will not be afraid of 10,000 of people who set themselves against me all around. Knowing that I have such a good friend to come to every night, or really any time of the day, has helped me to face my social problems. I used to feel overwhelmed by them, but they seem to me much more manageable now. Now, I'm not saying that these problems have just disappeared. No one is ever truly free of troubles in this world. But I feel that not only has God answered my prayers for help, he is the answer. I urge you all to call upon God in your times of trouble, for when you do, he will protect you, he will lift up your head, he will comfort you. And we are reassured as the psalm concludes, salvation is of the Lord and his blessing is upon his people. Thank you. It is my pleasure to introduce our final speaker, number nine, on topic number four. The Lord commanded us not to create idols, Exodus chapter 20, verse four, yet people continue to do so. Discuss the kinds of idols people worship today and the response that an Orthodox Christian should have when, they, when confronted by them. Speaker number nine. Your Eminence Metropolitan Methodios, Reverend Fathers, Honorable Judges, fellow participants and guests, good morning. If I stood up here for the next five minutes and said nothing, that would be really awkward, right? First, we'd all wonder what's going on up here, but then our thoughts might stray to checking a text message or a homework deadline. Our minds are always consumed with keeping up. Life is an obsession. It's a race to make as many checks on the checklist as we can. Our fast-paced lives create distracted and idolatrous minds that are uncomfortable with just being present in silence. John Calvin once said that the human heart is an idol factory. However, I believe that when we are faced by idolatry, we should refocus and let God transform our hearts into factories of his love. According to St. John Chrysostom, we were given two teachers from the beginning, nature and conscience. There's being an impartial voice which teaches human beings in silence. St. John Chrysostom is describing natural law which pertains to the essence of God's written law like the Ten Commandments. So although most people don't physically carve idols, there are common ways we violate the nature of the Second Commandment by creating idols in our hearts. We live in this world, but idolatry happens when we live for this world. I could almost guarantee that teens know more about the Kardashians than about Jesus. But I think the problem isn't just that we glorify money, fame, or beauty in specific. The root problem is our obsession with getting somewhere in life and the resulting addiction to the empty fulfillment of worldliness. In fact, I think success is one of the most overlooked and justified idols in our lives. I recently read a book for Orthodox youth called Who is God, Who am I, Who are you? It introduced me to the passion of pride. The passion of pride manifests when we idolize our desired path in this world and we become the God of our lives. It is like a big bright sun is shining, the son of God, yet we turn away 
put on sunglasses and try to lead our own way with a small flashlight. Whether we obsess about our achievements, our looks, or our money, worldliness traps us in a cycle of immediate gratification. Modern day idolatry leads to an unfulfilling busyness of the body. This creates distraction of the mind and soon, the soul ignores its goal of everlasting life and success in God's eyes. Mark 4.19 says, But the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. As a high school student, I have sometimes skipped church to do schoolwork. But as a guilty procrastinator, I know I can't exactly skip my homework and tell my teacher, let God's will be done. Nevertheless, I realize that skipping church may be more than just busyness. It can be a negligence of the second commandment. It is so easy to make excuses and put our busy lives above going to church. But as Orthodox Christians, we should all come together to glorify the true God. Because if we let God be the God of our lives, he will transform our hearts into factories of his love. Modern day idolatry often breaks the nature of the second commandment. Therefore, I think the most powerful counteraction is intangible and the simplest one of all. Silence. St. John Chrysostom said, that natural law teaches human beings in silence. So make silent time in prayer to be present with God, to let him be the focus of our minds and our hearts. God's voice is almost always a whisper. If we are distracted by worldly idols, we may not hear his voice. So in the silence after this speech, Let's all think about the words of the Russian saint Tikhon of Zadok. If we want to have our hearts filled with divine love, we must first empty them of love of this world, then turn our hearts to the one God, our only good and happiness and eternal beatitude. Thank you. That concludes our senior division. Once again, let's give them a full round of applause. We'll ask our judges to go to the deliberating room, and I will introduce our speakers in the order of which they spoke. Our first speaker is from the direct Archdiocese District, William Canelopoulos. William? Speaker number two from the metropolis of Pittsburgh is Stefan Bordiano. <laughs> Speaker number three from the Chicago metropolis is Dennis Polite. <laughs> from the Detroit metropolis, speaker number four is Victoria Martin. Speaker number five from the Denver Metropolis is Alexander Shaw. <laughs> Speaker number six from the San Francisco Metropolis is Dean Anagnostopoulos. <laughs> Speaker number seven, New Jersey Metropolis, Constantinos Nakas. And from the Boston Metropolis, speaker number eight, Alexandra Nichols. And speaker number nine from the Atlanta Metropolis, Elizabeth Curry.